Hello and welcome to the Nexus. Today's show, Angela's Ashes. Germany's Chancellor is just about holding things together. But facing pressure at home and abroad, is she feeling tempted to just call it a day and quit? We'll have some faking news for you in a moment. Also, as the EU's de facto headmistress, what can she do with those unruly boys from Italy, Austria and Hungary? And on vote, no word, speechless. How has Germany's quick exit from the World Cup coloured the mood in the country? All that and more coming up right now, here in the Nexus. Hello, I'm Matthew Moore, and today in the Nexus, the world's most powerful woman under pressure from all sides. How much longer can Angela Merkel stay on top? We're going to ask our panel, including Rory Broomfield. Now, he pushed hard for a Brexit and will give us his opinion from London. Uh, Bill Ravotti is an American who lives part of the year in the Czech Republic and spends his time campaigning to protect the sovereignty of Central European nations. And finally, we have Max Albrecht, a political commentator who lives in Munich. So now we're all gathered. Let's watch our first... Winter of the Nexus with some faking news out of Berlin. These are live pictures of the German capital, but just moments ago, Chancellor Angela Merkel quit. She's been under pressure as both leader of Germany and de facto leader of Europe. We'll have full analysis in a moment, but first, let's get a quick reminder of why she's been the most powerful woman in the world for years. Well, that might be some people's dream, but uh, it's not true. Merkel's still in charge, at least so far. Uh, Max, a, a few days ago, we were reading constantly. Her government was on the brink of collapse. Well, how, how close is she now uh, to, uh, to either consolidating her power or being pushed towards a door? So I think actually her position is probably much safer now than it was um, two weeks ago. I think the events of the last few weeks showed that the CSU under her poor self are really uh, sort of overplayed. They, they really overplayed their hand. Mm. Um, and it, it came to a tipping point where Seehofer threatened to resign and then mm -hmm. he, took that resi he took that resignation back. Um, the polls worked out very badly for the CSU throughout this whole process. The, it, all, the, all the polls have been showing that um, that his actions have been very unpopular in Germany, uh -huh. and and really all the all the major parties have had the ammunition to the, the, sorry the, the coalition partners the CSU and the SPD have had the ammunition in their hands uh, for a while now to to break the coalition, but they've all pulled back again and again because I think everybody realizes that new elections are not are not in the interests of any of the uh, of the parties within the coalition, and especially the party that is seen to to bring down the government will probably be punished by the uh -huh. voters. And also, so I would say her position is as safe as as safe as it's been for some time. Wow. Uh, well, she perhaps had this little masterstroke of giving him something. This little deal that they cooked up a couple of days ago. Let's take a look at the the, the main points that came out of that. So, 
she said to him, you know, we're going to limit the number of asylum seekers arriving in Germany, set up transit centres at, at the Austrian border to hold the migrants, and if they have already registered in another EU member state, they'll be sent back. And then very quickly afterwards, uh, the interior minister was asked what he made of the deal. Let's quickly listen to what he had to say. We have a clear Vereinbarung, wie wir die illegale Migration in der Zukunft an den Grenzen zwischen Deutschland und Österreich verhindern. So, Seehofer there, the Interior Minister from the junior partner in this coalition, saying he got what he wanted and he has one eye on the local elections coming up in October and he's worried that his party will be hit hard by the alternative for Deutschland party, and he's trying to show that he's tough on immigration too. Just take us through that quickly, Max. Yeah, so certainly the CSU is very concerned about their upcoming elections in October. The CSU mm. have, have uh, ruled Bavaria, in a, have won every election in Bavaria for the last 50 years or so, um, and they are threatened now with losing their majority, partly because they've lost a lot of voters to the AFD, um, and partly because they're not replacing those voters in the centre. Um, so Seehofer's plan seems to have been to pivot to the right. Um, having said that, it's been a very unsuccessful political ploy and there's, there's definitely a, a feeling amongst political commentators and amongst watchers that perhaps Seehofer was driven more by, by personal animosity towards Merkel and, yeah. and, to, and to some extent by his own ego and that his political strategy certainly is, uh, has been very ineffective and, and it's difficult to know whether it was your... a planned strategy that worked out badly or whether there sure. was no strategy in the first place. Now you're, you're living in Munich in Bavaria. Uh, you know the yes. people there. When they look at this deal between Seehofer and uh, Angela Merkel, will they be satisfied or will people still be tempted to drift towards the far right? So, um... I think the deal itself will, has been has been received as essentially a little bit of a fudge. Um, the, the transit centres will open while Zierhofer says he got what he wanted. The reality is that uh, asylum seekers who have registered elsewhere will not be will not be turned back at the border. They will be brought to to transit centres within Germany. And even though there will be a legal fiction mm. created to say that that's not technically Germany, it's not the same. There's also a lot of questions about how practically mm. this, this deal is going to work. Um, the details have been very thin so far. Um, and, the, and the third point, just for, for Zero politically, it's not clear that a lot of voters want uh, will leave the AFD because the CSU will never manage to move to the right of the AFD on, on sure. migrants, but he is leading support on the other side. I just want, to, just want to remind our viewers around the world what the far right are using uh, to gain support. Uh, they have some pictures here. Uh, cast your mind back to 2015, at the peak of the uh, migrant and asylum seeker crisis, we had people streaming across Europe in vast numbers. Apparently, Germany took in about a million people that year. Overall, uh, during the crisis, about 1.6 million. Now, Donald Trump and other people in, here in Europe uh, had some rather scathing remarks for Angela Merkel. Let's have a listen. So I used to be a fan of Merkel. I used to think she was terrific, a big leader, a great leader. I think what she did to Germany is a disgrace, is a disgrace. It's a total disgrace. And they walked all through Europe to get to Germany. Wait till you see what happens to Germany. They're having riots in the streets. They're having crime that they've never had before. Wait till you see the end result of what happens to Germany and Merkel. No longer a fan. I may have to deal with her, but you know what? I'll tell you right now, no longer a fan. Now, the, the far-right party, the AFD in Bavaria, I mean, they would, they would make the same points. Uh, let's, let's pick up on them. Uh, that they walk all through Europe and then make their destination Germany. So in, in that sense, they're picking and choosing the European country they want. And according to the Dublin Convention, one of the, the key uh, conventions in the European Union, they should stay and register in the first country they enter. So isn't that a valid point? Uh, well, so certainly under the Dublin Convention, they should stay and register. Um, it, but the challenge for Europe is that Europe, under the Schengen Agreement, has open borders. And the, the open borders have brought immense economic and social benefits to mm. Europe. Um, it's also perhaps not entirely feasible for, for the European Union to ask Italy and Greece to, to be the holding centres for, for all these migrants. What attracts so many people um, to Germany rather than any of the countries they're passing on the way there? 
Well, I think uh, a number of things probably. Certainly the economy is strong, the mm. wages are high. Um, it's seen, I think, amongst migrants as, as being more open to migrants. I think they face quite a hostile environment, certainly in, in Eastern Europe um, and, and within Italy. I mean, Italy has high unemployment, so does Spain. It's very difficult for migrants to, to find economic opportunity there. Mm. Um, and, and secondly, I think Merkel's open borders policy has been quite uh, misconstrued or, or misrepresented. Germany certainly doesn't have um, a policy of just letting everyone in and everyone being allowed to stay, but it's mm. been perceived that way to a large extent, and especially in 2015, that that news sort of rushed through amongst the immigrants, and, and many and, came and thinking that they were entitled to stay no matter what. And, and high, and high benefits, case. high uh, social security benefits, if you're not working, Germany is very generous. That's true. Um, although I, I would say that's that's true of most of Europe, um, and and actually, since the some of the reforms uh, made under under Schröder under the previous mm. government to Merkel, it's it, it's not as generous as it once was. I mean, a family living on Hartz IV in in Germany does not have it uh, all so easy. But certainly, there is okay. a social safety. I, I wanted to. You mentioned actually that uh, Trump uh, talked about predicting uh, crime. Actually, if you cast your mind back to New Year's Eve 2015, of course, there were uh, a, a wave of unprecedented uh, sexual assaults uh, on New Year's Eve. And we, we have some pictures here of right-leaning people uh, protesting against uh, those. Uh, that You're saying that that never materialised, Max? So certainly the Cologne uh, incident or Cologne attacks um, was was a big blow for Merkel, and, and it's, uh, that certainly happened. Um, it's not, uh, it should be, should be noted that the police afterwards came to the conclusion that it was probably uh, Moroccans and North, North Africans who'd been in Cologne for quite some time. So it was not a result mm. of the, the arrivals from 2015. Um, but certainly there have been high-profile incidents, not just Cologne. There have been a number this year of, of murders of girls that, that have been very high-profile in the media and obviously are appalling incidents. But statistically, Germany has, a, has this year recorded its lowest crime rate since 25 years. So. It right. certainly can't be said that there's been a, a massive increase in okay. crime as a result of that. All right, Maxwell, that's, that's Merkel's challenging situation at home, but she's also facing pressure from her fellow EU leaders. Now, sometimes Mrs Merkel's a bit like the head teacher of a high school, trying to discipline her pupils. And if you've ever watched an episode of EU High, you'd know how difficult that is. Here's a sample from the latest episode. The class of 2018 are becoming a little unruly. They just can't agree on how to solve the migrant and refugee problem. Star pupil Emmanuel Macron just wants everyone to work as a team. C'est avec cette même détermination que nous croyons très profondément à une réponse européenne face aux défis migratoires. Theresa May, well, she's had her eye on the door since class began. The Southern Europeans just can't solve the maths problem. 40,000 arrivals so far this year, too many for them to handle. At the back and making the most noise are the Central Europeans. The leaders of Hungary, the Czech Republic, Poland, Austria and Slovakia, all essentially against any migrants from outside the EU entering their countries. Fenyegeti az a népvándorlás, amit mind közösségesen migráció kérdésének szoktunk nevezni. Up the front, trying to keep control of things, is the headmistress, Angela Merkel. Europa has many challenges, but the migration of migration could be a question of the European Union. As the bloc's de facto leader, it's her job to try to get the class working together. So last week, they all went on a trip to Brussels. Things that didn't get off to a great start. Italy's new President Conte threatening to ruin the whole thing unless he was promised greater assistance. To keep him and Europe's other nationalist leaders happy, this is what they came up with. First up, anywhere but Europe. Leaders all agreed that the best places to stop, hold and process migrants coming to Europe was Turkey and North Africa. But that could be costly and certainly unreliable. Up next, what some are calling migrant prisons, officially secure centres for processing new arrivals. They'll be created on a voluntary basis. Problem is, France and others have already said they won't build any. 
Although numbers are well down from their 2015 chaotic peak, the migrant crisis remains Europe's central issue and the class's biggest test. For now, a rough plan has been agreed. Students have settled down. But like any group project, some will end up doing more of the heavy lifting than the others. So let's focus on the European aspect now of Merkel's challenges. Come to Bill Ravotti. Uh, Bill, you're in the Czech Republic. You spend a lot of your time uh, campaigning to protect the sovereignty of the V4, the, the, the four Central European countries we've heard from here. Uh, why do you think that's necessary to do that? Well, I think the heavy influence of uh, the Western EU bloc and Angela Merkel, Merkel um, has a tendency to want to try to impose their views and beliefs on the newer Central European nations. Uh, and they adamantly opposed uh, the open borders and mass migration from the start. There was never any EU solidarity, solidarity for this. Um, and they believe they have the right, in which they do, to decide who lives, who comes to their country, and who stays. But Merkel, uh, wants, a, Merkel wants a unified European approach where the burden is is shared. What's wrong with that? Well, I, I believe it's impossible to have, uh, as we said before, an EU uh, solution because there was never any EU solidarity on sharing migrants, on accepting migrants. This was a decision largely made by Merkel in Germany. Um, and to say that the Visegrad nations haven't done their share, uh, they led the way in helping to close the Balkan route. Now, Angela Merkel said the other day she was a great. She finally acknowledged um, the effort of, of Orban to help secure the internal borders, which greatly benefited Germany. That reduced flow to Germany uh, is, is a direct result uh, of the closing of the, uh, of the main closing of the Balkans, which was done by Hungary, Austria, Croatia, uh, and a number of other countries there. What, what do you make so, of the, the latest deal, which was extracted? by the, the new boy on the block, uh, Giuseppe Conte, the, Italy's new leader. He said, I'm not going to sign that communique until you give me some concessions. What do you make of those concessions? Are they good enough? Uh, well, first of all, Con Conte, is, in, in my opinion, is not the main power in Italy. That's Matteo Salvini. And yeah. Matteo Salvini. And, and, and the question so is... So he's the junior I, partner from he, the, La Liga. Let me tell you, the, the leader's driving the migration policy in Europe right now are not in Berlin. They're in Budapest, Vienna, and Rome in the name of Orban, Kurz, and Salvini. Um, they have the momentum now. And if you look at that EU summit, it was all about securing the external, board, external borders. Um, and no, in the, the V4 uh, gained a small victory by rejecting that the EU migrant quotas have finally been defeated. Um, it's not enough for you? No. <laughs> well, it, it, it's a victory, but there, there's no doubt in our minds that this issue will come up again. And so what would be York enough then, Bill? Well, we'd like to see, besides not forcing uh, European nation states to accept migrant quotas, but giving them the choice, we also want the external border secure so you can have free movement within the EU. And also, there's got to be the question of when do we start deporting the illegal migrants who, are, who, who should be here outside of Europe. Sending them back to Greece or Spain, I don't see how that solves the problem. OK, thank you for that, Bill. Uh, Rory, finally, we're coming to London. When you're looking at it uh, from these shores, what do you think uh, May's attitude towards this is now? We're not far away from Brexit, assuming it all goes mm. through. Does, does Britain still care? Well, Britain certainly does care. Theresa May certainly cares, uh, and her government also cares, in the sense that the government and the country as a whole will continue to have a relationship with the European Union, the countries within Europe, and the peoples of Europe uh, going forward post-Brexit. Uh, it does, uh, though, complicate certain issues uh, with regards to uh, Theresa May's main focus, which is pretty much getting the trade deal and the withdrawal agreement agreed because, of course, all this instability happening in Germany and elsewhere means that uh, there are many other things to discuss 
uh, for the European Union and indeed the priorities that uh, different countries have, uh, as opposed to what they should be focusing on and what the UK government is focusing on in uh, getting the best withdrawal agreement uh, put on the table and agreed to. Rory, I wanted to ask you, a lot of people say that were it not for those incredible pictures we saw in 2015 and, and a little later as well, it's just possible that uh, Britain would have opted to stay in the European Union. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, I don't agree with that because there are many other issues. Uh, there was Cameron's failed negotiation when he came back with pretty much nothing. Uh, there are the pictures uh, on, in terms of migration uh, in Italy and elsewhere that were being played constantly. But there are also wider issues uh, and those issues, including the direction of the country and indeed the European Union. Uh, of course, uh, Britain basically believed it was better off out, uh, better off out of uh, the system which was constraining the British trade, uh, British laws and British general, the general destiny of the British people. Thank you, Rory. Now, as you uh, all know, the World Cup is on, but Germany is out. To what extent did that early exit upset the national mood? How will it play into politics? Let's take a look. Crashing out of the World Cup so soon in the tournament left Germany speechless. Over and out and just plain out. I, I want to cry. I, I used to cry. I mean, it was terrible. But not for their opponents. We beat Germany! <laughs> The South Koreans were thrilled at their 2-0 victory, as were Germany's old rivals, the English. Ah, schadenfreude, a German word but a universal feeling of taking pleasure in someone else's pain. And of course bringing out the reworked old jokes about the VAR. Germany just isn't used to this kind of humiliation. The last time they did this poorly was 80 years ago, in 1938, when Switzerland sent them home in the first round. Their defeat has coloured the national mood, leaving Germans disappointed, deflated and downright dismayed. And if you don't believe football can be this important to Germans, consider this. They don't have the sartorial flair of the Italians, the cuisine of the French, or the wild spirit of the Spanish. But when it comes to football in Europe, they're second to no one. With four World Cup victories, only Italy can equal them. And this is where Germany likes to be, number one. Europe's biggest population, biggest economy, biggest selling cars, and once upon a time, its biggest military. But since World War II, it's deliberately restrained its military ambitions. And so while the UK and France are nuclear powers with aircraft carriers that can project their military might all over the world, Germany tends to be the junior partner. And so it's football that gives them the world stage on which they can demonstrate their superior strength, strategy and discipline. And then these usually rather restrained folk get to celebrate victories on the field with an unbridled surge of joy and patriotism. Let's go straight to Max now. Uh, Max, uh, how did it make you feel when uh, Germany got knocked out? Sorry to... I, was, I didn't mean to chuckle, but it just came out that way. <laughs> well, I think the whole world was chuckling. I think, you know, one, one, one thing is certain, the German team's done quite well in, in, the, in the past decade or so. And there yeah. was certainly seemed to be an, an outpouring of global joy when Germany went out this Yeah, time, everyone likes is... an underdog, don't they? Occasionally they yes. want the winners to uh, get a bit of a humiliation. But um, just wondering, um, if, if the Germans had won the World Cup, do you think, do you think down the line in October, when the ruling coalition uh, faced the local elections, they would it would have changed anything. I, I mean, I I don't think it would have seriously changed something. I mean, certainly, I think it's raised the prospect of long-serving German leaders who probably <laughs> need to be shown the door uh, in the in the form of Joachim Löw, um, yeah. and and whether that reflects on Angela Merkel. Yeah. Well, um, we've got a picture of the two leaders here. I mean, they both came to prominence, if you like, in 2005, didn't they? And everything was going so well, they hosted the World Cup in 2006, and then they won it in 2014. Uh, do you think she's going to want to separate herself a bit from him now? 
<laughs> well, I think it's too late for that. She's, yeah. she's often, uh, she's, she's really actually positioned herself very much with the ball team. And yes. one of the very few occasions when Germans see Merkel sort of express true uh, emotion and joy is, is when she yes. watches the football because she really does get very excited. Isn't that true actually of Germans generally? The, the, the time they feel the most comfortable to wave the flags and to really get behind the country is football rather than anything else. That's when they're really an unbridled eruption there. I think there's some truth to that. I think there's certainly for the for the people of Munich, there's essentially two times of year or, or, or two events where they where they really let go. One of them is uh, the football tournaments at the public viewings, um, and and the other is obviously Oktoberfest. So they have their, their set times to really yes. enjoy themselves. The I love the way you put that, year. Max. They have their set times to enjoy themselves, and they probably set a certain limit to it. And then that's Max. Thank you so much for your contribution to the Lexus today. Uh, we'll leave it there, otherwise we won't be punctual and on time. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill Conti, uh, thank you also for your contribution. And of course, Rory Broomfield, thank you for coming back to the Nexus. Well, remember, you can uh, watch this show and all our previous shows online on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for watching. See you next week.